Third part of chapter 7 of the first volume of The Life of Reason. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Fredrik Karlsson. The Life of Reason by George Santayana. Side note. Their mutual involution. The Life of Reason, the comprehension of causes and pursuits of aims, begins precisely where instinctive operation ceases to be merely such by becoming conscious of its purposes and representative of its conditions. Logical forms of thought impregnate and constitute practical intellect. The shock of experience can indeed correct, disappoint, or inhibit rational expectation, but it cannot take its place. The very first lesson that experience should again teach us after our disappointment would be a rebirth of reason in the soul. Reason has the indomitable persistence of all natural tendencies. It returns to the attack as waves beat on the shore. To observe its defeat is already to give it a new embodiment. Prudent itself is a vague science and science, when it contains real knowledge, is but a clarified prudence, a description of experience and a guide to life. Speculative reason, if it is not also practical, is not reason at all. Propositions irrelevant to experience may be correct in form. The method they are reached by may parody scientific method, but they cannot be true in substance, because they refer to nothing. Like music, they have no object. They merely flow, and please those whose unattached sensibility they somehow flatter. Hume, in this respect, more radical and satisfactory than Kant himself, saw with perfect clearness that reason was an ideal expression of instinct and that consequently no rational spheres could exist other than the mathematical and the empirical, and that what is not a datum must certainly be a construction. In establishing his tendencies to feign at the basis of intelligence, and in confessing that he yielded to them himself, no less in his criticism of human nature than in his practical life, he admitted the involution of reason, that unintelligible instinct, in all the observations and maxims vouchsafed to an empiricist or to a man. He veiled his doctrine, however, in a somewhat unfair and satirical nomenclature, and he has paid the price of that indulgence in personal humor by incurring the immortal hatred of sentimentalists who are too much scandalized by his tone ever to understand his principles side note rationalistic suicide if the common mistake in empiricism is not to see the omnipresence of reason in thought the mistake of rationalism is not to admit its variability and dependence, not to understand its natural life. Parmenides was the Adam of that race, and first tasted the deceptive kind of knowledge which, promising to make man God, banishes him from the paradise of experience. His sin has been transmitted to his descendants, though hardly in its magnificent and simple enormity. The whole is one, Sinophonus had cried, gazing into heaven, and that same sense of a permeating identity, translated into rigid and logical terms, brought his sublime disciple to the conviction that an indistinguishable, immutable substance was omnipresent in the world. Parmenides carried association by similarity to such lengths that he arrived at the idea of what alone is similar in everything, viz. the fact that it is. Being exists, and nothing else does whereby every relation and variation in experience is reduced to a negligible illusion, and reason loses its function at the moment of asserting its absolute authority. 
notable lesson taught us like so many others by the first experiments of the greek mind in its freedom and insight a mind led quickly by noble self-confidence to the ultimate goals of thought such a pitch of heroism and abstraction has not been reached by any rationalist since no one else has been willing to ignore entirely all the data and constructions of experience save the highest concept reached by assimilations in that experience no one else has been willing to demolish all the scaffolding and all the stones of his edifice hoping still to retain the sublime symbol which he had planted on the summit yet all rationalists have longed to demolish or to degrade some part of the substructure like those gothic architects who wished to hang the vaults of their churches upon the slenderest possible supports abolishing and turning into painted crystal all the dead walls of the building so experience and its crowning conceptions were to rest wholly on a skeleton of general natures physical forces being assimilated to logical terms and concepts gained by identification of similars taking the place of those gained by grouping disparate things in their historical conjunctions these contiguous sensations which occasionally exemplify the logical contrasts in ideas and give them incidental existence were either ignored altogether and dismissed as unmeaning or admitted merely as illusions the eye was to be trained to pass from that particolored chaos to the firm lines and permanent divisions that were supposed to sustain it and frame it in rationalism is a kind of builder's bias which the impartial public cannot share for the dead walls and glass screens which may have no function in supporting the roof are yet as needful as the roof itself to shelter and beauty so the incidental filling of experience which remains unclassified under logical categories retains all its primary reality and importance the outlines of it emphasized by logic though they may be essential vehicle of our most soaring thoughts are only a method and a style of architecture they neither absorb the whole material of life nor monopolize its values and as each material imposes upon the builder's ingenuity a different type of construction and stone wood and iron must be treated on different structural principles so logical methods of comprehension spontaneous though they be in their mental origin must prove themselves fitted to the natural order and affinity of the facts footnote b this natural order and affinity is something imputed to the ultimate object of thought the reality by the last act of judgment assuming its own truth it is of course not observable by consciousness before the first experiment in comprehension has been made the act of comprehension which first imposes on the sensuous material some subjective category is the first to arrive at the notion of an objective order the historian however has a well-tried and mature conception of the natural order arrived at after many such experiments in comprehension from the vantage point of this latest hypothesis he surveys the attempts others have made to understand events and compares them with the objective order which he believes himself to have discovered this observation is made here lest the reader should confuse the natural order imagined to exist before any application of human categories with the last conception of that order attained by the philosopher the latter is but faith the former is faith's ideal object nor is there in this necessity any violence to the spontaneity of reason 
for reason also has manifold forms and the accidents of experience are more than matched in variety by the multiplicity of categories here one principle of order and there another shoots into the mind which breeds more genera and species than the most fertile terrestrial slime can breed individuals side note complementary character of essence and existence language then with the logic embedded in it is a repository of terms formed by identifying successive perceptions as the external world is a repository of objects conceived by superposing perceptions that exist together being formed on different principles these two orders of conceptions the logical and the physical do not coincide and the attempt to fuse them into one system of demonstrable reality or moral physics is doomed to failure by the very nature of the terms compared when the eleatics prove the impossibility that is the inexpressibility of motion or when kant and his followers prove the unreal character of all objects of experience and of all natural knowledge their task was made easy by the native diversity between the concretions in existence which were the object of their thought and the concretions in discourse which were its measure the two do not fit and entrenched as these philosophers were in the forms of logic they compelled themselves to reject as unthinkable everything not fully expressible in those particular forms thus they took their revenge upon the vulgar who being busy chiefly with material things and dwelling in an atmosphere of sensuous images call unreal and abstract every product of logical construction or reflective analysis these logical products however are not really abstract but as we have seen concretions arrived at by a different method than that which results in material conceptions whereas the conception of a thing is a local conglomerate of several simultaneous sensations logical entity is a homogeneous revival in memory of similar sensations temporally distinct thus the many armed with prejudice and the few armed with logic fight an eternal battle the logicians charging the physical world with unintelligibility and the man of common sense charging the logical world with abstractness and unreality the former view is the more profound since association by similarity is the more elementary and gives constancy to meanings while the latter view is the more practical since association by contiguity alone informs the mind about the mechanical sequence of its own experience neither principle can be dispensed with and each errs only in denouncing the other and wishing to be omnivorous as if on the one hand logic could make anybody understand the history of events and the conjunction of objects or on the other hand as if cognitive and moral processes could have any other terms than constant and ideal natures the nameable essence of things or the standard of values must always be an ideal figment existence must always be an empirical fact the former remains always remote from natural existence and the latter irreducible to a logical principle footnote c for the sake of simplicity only such ideas as precede conceptions of things have been mentioned here after things are discovered however they may be used as terms in a second ideal synthesis and a concretion in discourse on a higher plane may be composed out of sustained concretions in existence proper names are such secondary concretions in discourse venice is a term covering many successive aspects and conditions not distinguished in fancy belonging to an object existing continuously in space and time 
each of these states of venice constitutes a natural object a concretion in existence and is again analyzable into a mass of fused but recognizable qualities light motion beauty each of which was an original concretion in discourse a primordial term in experience a quality is recognized by its own idea or permanent nature a thing by its constituent qualities and an embodied spirit by fusion into an ideal essence of the constant characters possessed by a thing to raise natural object into historic entities it is necessary to repeat upon a higher plane that concretion in discourse by which sensations were raised to ideas when familiar objects attain this ideal character they have become poetical and achieved a sort of personality they then possess a spiritual status thus sensuous experience is solidified into logical terms these into ideas of things and these recast and smelted again in imagination into forms of spirit End of footnote. End of chapter 7